Hey everyone, I am thrilled to be here today with Kaylin Jean-Louis. And I want to give you a little bit of background about how I came to be here with Kaylin today. Uh, Kaylin, uh, I saw her on a, an event earlier this year that was put on by the American Association of Caregiving Youth, AACY. And they are an amazing organization based here in South Florida. And full disclosure, I'm on their National Advisory Council. So that's why I was on that event as well. So I saw Kaylin in these little boxes here and I was listening to Kaylin and what she was saying. I was like, wow, I've got to talk to this person. So we waited until she turned 18 years old very recently. And here we are. So welcome, Kaylin. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored. My pleasure. And I'll share a little bit more about you with our audience, and then we'll get into some conversation questions and just kind of riff from there. So uh, Kaylin is a 2023 summa cum laude graduate of Florida State University Schools and Tallahassee Community College. Uh, yeah. And she recently started Florida A&M University, majoring in broadcast journalism. Uh, she is a youth caregiver advocate, uh, motivational speaker, philanthropist, and power team. Uh, and she is the founder and executive director of Kaylin's Caring Connection, Inc., which we will talk about a bit more. Yes. And so, Kaylin, without further ado, let's, let's just jump in. Tell us, where was your childhood? My childhood was here, born and raised here in Tallahassee, Florida, where I have been able to be a part, well, be here for my entire life and be able to make friends, go to different schools, and just really grow up into the young woman I am today. Cool. Now, how many siblings do you have? I have two sisters, one through blood and one through marriage, but love them both so much. That's awesome. So what... What had you become a caregiver and, and how old were you when this happened? So my journey began a couple years ago, I would want to say around 2016. And one day my mom started noticing some strange signs in my grandmother, such as she was forgetting how to drive. When she went to cook some things on the stove, sometimes she left the stove on after, even when it got into bathing herself, that got a little bit foreign to her and even one of her passions which was sewing started to become a little here nor there where she'd have some incidents where she would forget how to do some things or in the process she would not be able to maintain what she was doing and after this we started going to my grandmother's house a lot more actually going day after day every time I got out of school we'd be at her house and we'd be making sure she was taken care of and then we started bringing her to our house on the weekend so that she could be taken care of at night and wouldn't have to worry about anything and vice versa. But eventually, due to the progression of my grandmother's disease, which is Alzheimer's dementia, she had to or we had to move into her house in 2017 to provide her 24 hour care. And that was a big but honestly we knew we were going to have to make this decision because we wanted her to have that love and that care right with those that she loved and those that she was comfortable with. And around this time, my mom was willing to do it by herself. You know, she is super mom to me. And so when she took this on, she's like, I'll take care of her. You don't have to necessarily do anything. But I knew from the start, I'm living in the house. I don't want her to go through alone through it alone. And I just knew that I, at some point, wanted to be her youth caregiver, help her in those places. And so me and her became a team. Now we do this for a year and we are, I'm helping my grandmother, whether it's transporting her to the bathroom, helping my mom prepare her food, making sure she's okay. And a year later, my mom gets a call that my great grandmother in love who lives in central Florida needs to be provided with 24 hour watch care as well. So of course, without hesitation, my mom and I get a week that weekend, we go down there, pack up all her things and bring her back to Tallahassee with us where we both step into the role of caregivers of two. And it was crazy. It was a crazy year and a half of going and making sure both of them got settled into that place together. But with all of that, 
I was happy that I got the chance to be their caregiver and to step into this role because they did so much for me when I was younger, right? You hear people say all the time to take care of your elders and make sure they're okay. And that was the attitude I channeled when all of this happened. I was about 11 years old when I became caregiver for my grandmother and 12 when I became a caregiver for my great grandmother. So I'm just getting into the point where I'm close to being a teenager and all these things are going on. Lots of sacrifices, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, thanks for sharing all of that. It's, it's amazing what you've done and how you had a partnership with your mom in that journey. And that leads me to another question. You know, what kind of external support from community organizations did you have and what, what did that look like? Well, our external support kind of, we call it our village um, of people we've been able to acquire over the years. But before organizations, it really was our family, friends, and those that we have at church or just seeing people in our lives that if we needed to have a moment of reprieve, my mom would call them and ask them to come watch my grandmother for a few hours while maybe me and her went out, got our nails done, or just went and saw a movie just so we could still have that mother-daughter time outside of being caregivers. We also had a few, my mom definitely got involved with the Alzheimer's Association with when everything first happened because one, she wanted to cling to her research and be able to learn more about the disease, but then she got involved in the organization and introduced it to me. And so we were able to get some help as far as teaching wise. If my grandmother was progressing to a new stage and we were unfamiliar, the Alzheimer's Association was there and they were able to help us as well as the Big Ben hospice transition care facility they've been able to really help us and we've just had a lot of support from people honestly that have known my grandmother have known my mom have known me my grandma like I said she was a seamstress so around Tallahassee she's pretty known and no matter the dementia or from her being in church or different things a lot of people she was always or she's always been that person who no matter who it is she cares for them no matter what's going on, she always was that, was that person who would lend them a hand. And so because she was like that with so many people, we've just been blessed enough to have those step in, to come sit with her, to come watch her, that have really helped us in this situation and supported us through this journey. Wow, that's amazing. I, I did not know that from our previous talk about your, your grandma. So thanks for sharing that. That's that's, nice. that's beautiful. So uh, I have a three-part question for you. Okay. Um so what were the biggest challenges you faced as a result of caregiving? How did that limit your life as a child as, and student, a uh, teenager? And, and, and at the same time, how did it enhance your life? Well, starting with the first part of the question, I think some of the biggest challenges I faced, number one would be just the entire nature of dementia, you know? You have to, me watching my grandmother literally deteriorate before my eyes, her memory fade away, having to deal with that, she doesn't recognize me. Or even while caring for her, she may call me my aunt's name or my mom's name or somebody else I do not know, but she cannot physically recognize me. She knows I'm here and she's comfortable with me, but her not being able to be my grandmother in that phase. There may be times where I'm having a, down day or sad day and I can't just go over and be like hi grandma tell her about things that's definitely was one of the biggest challenges when the journey started because I just knew that it was something I would have to adjust to and I think another challenge was just making sure that I knew where I fit in because my mom again she's primary caregiver so she handles all of the big things and I just was kind of there where if she needed help I'd be there to offer so it was really trying to figure out where do I step in and help where do I need to sit back what can I do to make the process easier for both of us and as far as it limiting me, I wouldn't really say that caregiving has limited me because my mom always made sure that if there was something I wanted to do or something I desired that I was able to do it and that I had people who would uh, help us through the process so that I could still be a student and a child and enjoy some of the things that everyone got to do. I mean, of course, there were sacrifices where there'd be times where my friends would be going out to certain events 
And because of caregiving, I was not able to go to every single one of them, but I was still able, I was in marching band at my school. So I was able to do that. My mom would just come during halftime to watch me and go back, but there would be, she still allowed me to have that moment where I could be a child and even while caregiving, I mean, it didn't affect my grades because I've always been on top of those. It didn't affect my GPA of when everything first happened though. Emotionally, it was difficult because I had to get used to the fact that one, we're moving out of our house to go care for her. So I'm moving to another location. My schedule changed a little bit and I had to maneuver, but ultimately I would say it was an enhancement. Caregiving brought so much positivity and so many branches of what I want to do now in my life because with with being a caregiver and being able to connect with others who are caregivers or who may know someone who is a caregiver I've been able to talk to those I was able to start a branch with my organization called the Youth Care 2 movement where I really just wanted to celebrate honor and recognize other youth caregivers that were locally here in Tallahassee with me and abroad just to let them know that we see them and we care for them and while they are caring for others we care for them and And just doing that having that part it enhanced my life to the point where I am proud to be a caregiver I'm proud to advocate for others and really pave the way for other youth caregivers I'm not sure if you know this but there I mean there's so many statistics with adult caregivers right We don't really know much about youth caregivers. There's probably a lot more because they say about 5.8 million, I think roughly, but there's so many more that are just unseen and they may not even recognize that they are a youth caregiver. Maybe they're just caring for brother and sister or they're caring for their grandparent or caring for a parent. But just to be able to use my voice and be an example to others that you can make it through the journey and you can still have a life it's something that I'm just proud to say that I have. So yeah, it's it's been a big positive. I know you're, you know, you're very astute young woman. So you know that it's often not the case where yeah. there are where youth caregivers have the freedom to be a part of the band, be a part of their friends group. Often they're very isolated. Um And so with that in mind, and with your organization in mind, which we're gonna talk about in a few minutes, um, just at a high level, what what changes would you like to see in society for youth caregivers? And and then we'll talk about how does KCK play a part in that? I really would like to see there be more laws passed. You know, there's a lot of times where I've noticed even in the school system when youth caregivers are just people when students in general are getting ready for higher education or scholarships you have to have a lot of community service and you know as a youth caregiver you cannot attend everything you cannot go to every school event or outside of class thing to get service hours and so I would love to see them or just different states allow youth caregiver hours to be used in those slots if they're applying for scholarships or they're applying to get into school, allow that to be a part of their community service. Because at the end of the day, it is a great service. They're caring for a loved one who may be going through a disease or going through something. I think another thing I would like to see is there's just more representation of youth caregivers, especially whether that's in the media or that is in the different apps that we see or the different people we talk to or the events that they have. I think there definitely needs to be more representation and people talking about youth caregivers. So it's something that's normal and that people can really see apart what they need to incorporate or what group they need to recognize. Cause we hear caregivers all the time. We hear about people in different ethnic and racial and socioeconomic groups, but youth caregivers are going through a lot of things and they're not able to get support if people don't know about them. And so I think that's important. I think my last thing just in general is more support, whether we can have people or organizations giving monetary donations or they're able to have times where if a youth caregiver cannot make it to the grocery store, maybe somebody picks up their groceries for them or maybe they help bless them with the little stipends to help them get through the month and have less stress so that they can care, but also still be a kid, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so with Kaylin's Caring Connection, um, you alluded to it a little bit earlier about when it started. Uh, mm-hmm. And 
can you tell us a little bit more what it does and how is it funded? Kaylin's Karen Connection. Kaylin's Karen Connection is a nonprofit that I started back in 2016. And that focus, when I first started, it was solely on helping youth. I've always been a person who likes my peers and likes helping those younger than me. And I always wanted to make sure that they were cared for, especially during the holiday season, because I was that kid that got presents from my parents. I was able to celebrate, but I knew that there were kids in the hospital who weren't able to just go out, have hot cocoa with their family or be able to go out because they were dealing with underlying health issues. And so I started off with just giving teddy bears and toys to the hospital here in Tallahassee. And once I started with that, it just kind of expanded over the years of keeping the focus of youth, but going from different organizations such as the Ronald McDonald House or the Hang Tough Foundation or being able to partner with group homes. We actually partnered with a group last year called the Love Heals Group, which was a group for young girls who had lost their mothers. And of course, that's hard during the Christmas season to be able to celebrate when you don't have the one you love the most. And we were able to put together just a nice event where they could put on their PJs, come laugh, eat some good food, hear from some good speakers, but also have fun and just be able to enjoy themselves. And so Kaylin's Care and Connection is simply an organization where we meet needs for others in the community. And we make sure people are able to see that there are still those who care in society. It's funded through the community. We have a lot of those those who are able to donate to us, whether that's through our cash app or straight on the website or through PayPal. But we have a lot of community donations. We have had at times sponsors who would sponsor certain events. But a lot of times, like I said, it's really those who help us in the community. And of course, being a business owner, everyone knows that at some point you're going to have to pour some some of your own money and some of your own sweat and tears into your own organization. And so it's a mixture of both of those things to really keep the organization running. That, that's incredible. Uh, so it kind of brings me to the final questions, which will just kind of bring it all together. Um, so let's look into the future. And I'm sure you look into the future and you are just starting college and you're broadcast journalism. And so how do you see tying in broadcast journalism with your past experience as caregiver advocate and, and all of that enhancing your vision for life moving forward. I would love to do a lot more reporting. And like I said, representation of youth caregivers as a journalist, whether that is finding people here locally or outside who have stories that haven't been shared and broadcasting them out to the world. I also want to be able to get those more in-depth skills of broadcast journalism, because I just think there's a lot of issues going on in the world. And my motto in life has always been, I want to talk about the negative things, but I want to push more positivity into the media because we constantly see sad news or heartbreaking stories or just crazy and outlandish things happening. And I've always wanted to be able to use my voice to be a positive light, a nice, fresh voice that really just allows people to feel encouraged and allows them to really push through to the next day. And so as a broadcast journalist, I just think that with Everything that I've been through as a caregiver, as a student, just with different things going on personally, every negative situation I've had, I've wanted, I've always saw it from another perspective. And that's what I want to continue pushing as I go into the future with my career is there will be times where you have some pretty sucky situations, but the product and the end result of those situations can be a lot better when you really put your best foot forward and you really do what you love. So that's what I look forward to doing. Well, I can say this. I've now known you from the little box originally with AACY's event, which was awesome. We've had a chance to talk before this, and now we've talked here. I'm pretty confident that you're going to succeed at whatever you do. And so Thank I you. wish you all the best with school, your vision for the future, and bringing positivity to this world, because we know we can always use more of that. 
Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I'm just happy to have been a part because I really do believe that the more we share our stories and talk about things with you caregivers and just in life, the more people will see it and be able to feel comfortable talking about it. And the more the conversations just keep going. I agree 100%. Thanks so much for taking the time. And I wish you all the best with school and everything moving forward. Thank you so much. The primary purpose of the podcast is to educate. While guests are invited to listen, listeners acknowledge that they are not being provided professional advice from the podcast or any guests. One Day One Week and its sponsor, 17 Commerce LLC, expressly disclaim any and all liability or responsibility for any direct, indirect, incidental, special, consequential, or other damages arising out of any individual's use of reference to, reliance on, or inability to use the podcast episodes or the information presented in the episodes.